Today is the 120th day the American hostages have been held captive in Tehran. And today marks the end of the first week of the UN Tribunal's investigation into the alleged crimes of the deposed Shah. They have been asked also to investigate Iranian charges of U.S. complicity in those acts. Why do so many Iranians believe in U.S. complicity, guilt? Why do they so fervently endorse the anti-American Khomeini and the holding of the hostages? Of course, we know the embassy takeover was triggered by the Shah's entry into the U.S. last October for medical treatment. More about that later. But beyond that, the fury in Iran focuses on the undenied fact that the CIA restored the exiled Shah to the Peacock throne back in 1953. And after that, the Iranians have been told, the CIA helped the Shah set up Sarak, the secret police force that has tortured so many thousands of them. A classified Senate Foreign Relations Committee report confirms the CIA's role in forming Sarak. It says, the CIA provided the Shah money as well as training for that purpose. Of course, the brutality came later. In 1976, in Niavaran Palace in Tehran, I asked the Shah about the continuing reports of torture inflicted by his Savak upon so many of his citizens. Now, when an outfit like the International Commission of Jurists comes here mm -hmm. and then comes out with a report saying that in spite of what you say, Your Majesty, mm -hmm. torture continues. How do they know? Well, they can't continue saying this. Well, they talk about psychological and physical torture. Physical, I don't believe. I talked Not anymore. Maybe in the old days, maybe. I talked just today to a man whom I believe who told about torture. How many years ago? Within, I want to be very careful, not yesterday. Ah, well, maybe. I don't know. The word has gone out to stop it. To stop what? Torture. But a long time ago, yes. How long ago? Well, I won't tell you, as you don't tell me. This was the man who had told me just hours before my interview with the Shah in the fall of 1976, who told me about torture still going on, Raji Samgabadi, then a highly respected Iranian journalist who now reports for Time magazine. I spoke to him in New York a few days ago. When you told me back in 1976, October, Yes. The torture, physical torture, was still going on. How did you know it? My brother was released from jail, perhaps a week after, before I saw you, there were torture marks all over his body. The physical torture went on, and the psychological torture was worse than physical torture. My own brother, a political prisoner, was taken once to this dark room and shown the mangled bodies of a few persons, and he was told that relatives of his, including his brother, including his mother and his father, were among the corpses. And he was instructed to identify them. So he spent hours and hours and hours trying to decide whether the stump of a head, the smashed pulp of a face, belonged to his brother, to his mother. You mean you? Yes. And this was a deliberate lie, but he didn't know. So through a series of psychological tortures, as His Majesty said, uh, they drove him crazy, insane, and he came out. Thousands and thousands of dollars went into his treatment. And uh, even now, I can't say that he is a complete human being. Raji Sam Gabadi spoke then of an episode that took place on the occasion of President Carter's visit to Tehran on New Year's Eve, December 1977. We were celebrating the New Year's Eve with the American press in the Hilton Hotel. And uh, Mr. Carter was given a speech that night saying, I don't, I don't remember the words exactly, but he was saying that America has never had such a good friend. America has never been so close with another nation, with another leader. And it profoundly touches us that the Shah takes care of his people so well, and his people love him so well. On that very night, New Year's Eve, said Sam Gabadi, his brother was seized with another fit. 
and he brought him to a mental hospital close to the Shah's palace. And a doctor there told me that 70% of our cases are Savak tortured people. It is 1978, about two years, perhaps 15 months after your talk with the Shah and after his claim that torture is not going on. Max McCarthy, three-term Democratic congressman, now Washington bureau chief of the Buffalo News, was press officer at the American Embassy in Tehran in 76. He had put me in touch with Sam Gabadi. Raji Sam Gabadi told mm -hmm. us about his brother. Did you know the brother? I did. And? He was uh, in prison, tortured, and I saw him afterward, and the poor guy was just a walking dead man. I mean, he, he was a zombie. As a result of torture at the hands of Savak. Right. A trial of two Savak torturers held in Iran after the fall of the Shah. One of a score of such trials during which these men and others confessed to heinous crimes sticking hot iron bars in noses and eyes, hanging prisoners upside down to beat them, using everything from thick whips to electric shock, raping both male and female prisoners, torturing one member of the family in front of the other. Often victims were then forced to swallow cyanide tablets or taken out and shot. Some other victims, like this young Iranian we filmed a few weeks ago in a London hospital, were permanently crippled. Over three years in an Iranian prison, he was apparently subjected to repeated spinal injections, another form of torture. He is paralyzed, unable to talk. Doctors say he soon will die. Is it your understanding that we, you in the embassy, knew what was going on with Savak? Well, I did. In fact, it was such acts by Savak and the indifference of the American diplomatic establishment in Iran to such savagery that caused Max McCarthy to resign as press officer there in late 1976. And he wrote a report following his resignation. In your report, you say, U.S. mission personnel are regularly warned not to divulge to any American correspondent information that Iranian government does not want disclosed or which tells too much about the U.S. role in Iran. You serious? That's right. In other words, Dick Helms, as ambassador, would say, look, the U.S. role in Iran, we don't want too much news of that in Correct. the American press. Correct. Ambassador Helms was pro-Shah. Right. Well, he used to say there's no alternative to the Shah. Which I suppose at that time uh, Americans generally believed. And so in, in being pro-Shah, you, you did what the Shah wanted you to do in effect. Right. There was a... That, that was a very prevalent idea, giving the Shah what he wants, remember? There were articles to that effect, and... And why was it so important to give the Shah what he wants? Well, because he was our pillar in the Persian Gulf, and we built our whole security on this one man. All right. Therefore, if the Shah committed excesses... We had to forgive that. If we knew about corruption that went on... Right. There were more transcendently important considerations than corruption and repression. So the United States knew really what was going on, but was willing to say, well, wait a minute, for the greater good of the greater number of people, let's turn our back on these brutalities, excesses, corruptions. I believe that's a fair statement. It was not just in Iran in the late 70s that Americans knew what was going on. Jesse Leaf was Iran analyst for the CIA in Langley, Virginia, in the early 70s. He had heard reports of Savak brutalities, and he wanted to do something about it. And in fact, at one point, I was going to write a report on torture in Iran, and I was told not to. By? By, on division level. This was in what year? Uh, I, it was in, uh, I can't give you an exact year. I believe it was 70, 71, something like that. Well, who was the head of the CIA at the time? Well, the head of the CIA at the time was, was Richard Helms, but... Um, he would have known about it. Well, you'd either have to be blind, deaf, and dumb in a presidential candidate not to know there was torture going on in Iran. I mean, it was all over the place. Amnesty International has a huge file on, on, on what happened. I, I have seen from various, I have saw from various sources descriptions of torture rooms in Savak headquarters in Tehran. We knew it was happening, and we did nothing about it. 
and I was told not to do anything about it. it this was an internal Iranian affair. Iran Savak's job was to keep the lid on dis dissident elements within the population. Originally it was communist, then it meant anybody who said to look crosswise at the shop. Mm -hmm. By definition, Mike, an enemy of the Shah was an enemy of the CIA. They were, we were very close. We were friend, This was a very close relationship between the United States and Iran. What do you know, Mr. Leaf, about the CIA, Savak, and Torch? When the agency set up Savak, they had regular uh, instructional classes. Part of the instructional classes w were in interrogation techniques. As part of intensive interrogation techniques, torture is covered. That, Leaf says, was a classroom lecture. Although one former Savak agent still in Iran claims the CIA actually showed Savak agents how to physically torture prisoners. Yeah, it's baloney. Especially coming from the source. I mean, he's working for, he's working for the other side now. Uh, you mean he's testifying in order to save his own life? Oh, I think, I think so. We didn't, have to, we didn't have to teach the Iranians torture, I mean, or to torture people. They have a long, long growing history in that part of the world of torture. So it's, it's an everyday thing. So far, we've been talking about Savak in Iran. But what about Savak outside Iran? Like our own CIA, Savak also conducted operations abroad. Here is a vivid example. We first told this tale three years ago on 60 Minutes. It centered on this man, then living in Paris, Jules Kanpira, an adventurer, a soldier of fortune. Born in the Soviet Union, he lived clandestinely in Western Europe, a stateless man, in and out of prison several times until finally he was granted an Iranian passport and went to work as a journalist in Tehran. Then, he says, he was contacted by Savak and sent back to France on a mission of political assassination. His first target was to be Sadek Gobzadek, the man who is now Iran's foreign minister, but who, when we first met him three years ago in Paris, was a little-known supporter of an Iranian religious leader then in exile in Iraq, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Kanpira, instead of killing Gobzadek, told him the whole story, and told him also that he had been commissioned by Savak to kill another man, an American, Nasser Afshar, a wealthy businessman formerly an Iranian, now an American citizen, whose home was in Alexandria, Virginia, where he published the Iran Free Press, a newspaper filled with attacks against the Shah, his regime, and his family. Why would the Savak want to kill you, Nasser Afshar? Because I'm the publisher of Iran Free Press. Simple as that? Simple as that. My dear friend Mike, uh, I think this is very ridiculous. Ardashir Zahedi today lives in exile in Switzerland. At the time of our report on Savak three years ago, he was Iran's ambassador to the United States. We are not the people who want to kill anyone. We had traitors in the past. Many of them has come back, even the communists. But when we checked out Kanpira's story three years ago, it stood up. We were satisfied he was telling the truth, though every government agency we talked to at the time denied it the State Department, the CIA. No one knew anything about it, or so they said. And there the matter stood until the Senate Foreign Relations Committee investigated the activities of foreign intelligence organizations in the United States, including Savak. We have secured a portion of that classified report from Dale Van Atta of Jack Anderson's staff, and it confirms Confira's story in every detail. It says the CIA had known of the Afshar assassination plot for more than a year prior to our broadcast. That the Bureau of Intelligence and Research of the State Department had been told about it by the CIA. And that the U.S. Embassy in Iran had also indicated that one Jules Kanpira had been trained in assassination techniques. Though Kanpira never operated in the United States, a network of Savak agents did. How did we learn that? from the Shah of Iran himself when I spoke to him in 1976. And they are there for the purpose of checking up on Iranian students? Checking up on anybody who becomes affiliated with circles, organizations hostile to my country. 
which is the role of any intelligence organization. And they are there with the knowledge and consent of the United States government? I think it is. That statement caused a flap. Henry Kissinger categorically denied U.S. knowledge of Savak activity here, but he promised to make inquiries. Two weeks later, his aide, Robert Funseth, announced that after an investigation, the State Department had, quote, found no evidence of any illegal or improper activity. Well, that was totally misleading, as the Senate report makes clear. The report confirms that Savak's primary function in the United States was to spy on Iranian dissidents like these students, who could be targets for Savak upon their return to Iran. And the report says also that the CIA itself furnished Savak with information gathered by the FBI. Training of Savak personnel continued in the U.S. And the CIA did not ask that Savak refrain from using, in the United States, the surveillance techniques it learned here. And during the Carter years, Savak activity continued here. In July of 78, according to the Washington Post, then Deputy Attorney General Civiletti warns Zbigniew Brzezinski that Savak was involved in significant police, security, and non-diplomatic activity in the U.S. But there is no indication, the Post said, that Brzezinski made any move to tighten control over Savak's actions. Why the reluctance of the United States to crack down on Savak, or even to send its agents home? Three years ago, Ambassador Zahedi answered my question about that quite candidly. And if the U.S. government tells Iran to pull its Savak agents out of this country? If the United States government does not want it, we are not going to insist and we shall ask them to leave. At the same time, we shall ask your people to leave my country. That threat coming from the Shah himself was repeated many times to U.S. officials in documents we have seen. The United States was not willing to pay that price. Iran was a vital listening post for the CIA, with a thousand miles and more of border with the Soviet Union. Former CIA officer, now political science professor Richard Cottom, explains. The fact that the Shah allowed are watching operations from Iran, monitoring operations, terribly important to us. But I'd say um, more generally that wherever you have this kind of liaison relationship with another service like uh, SAVAK, that the hold they have over you is very substantial. Our support for Iran meant turning a blind eye to the excesses of the Shah. And according to Cotton, it meant failing to recognize the mounting opposition to the Shah inside Iran and he holds Henry Kissinger responsible. He coined the phrase total commitment. Why look at a minor group of opposition people and gratuitously annoy the Shah when the operations that we do jointly are so important to both countries? What you seem to be saying, Professor Cottom, is that when the question, who lost Iran, is finally asked, Henry Kissinger is, the, is at the top of your culprits list. I think Henry Kissinger's idea of diplomacy in this sense is, is uh, intolerable. I believe that you should never be in a position of not reading the full breadth of, uh, of public opinion in any country. And uh, Kissinger to cut us off entirely from, from a major uh, popular force, I think is, is uh, to a, a very extensive extent uh, responsible for a lot of what's happened, yes. Two events in 1978 infuriated and unified the legions who opposed the Shah. The January massacre in the holy city of Qom by Savak and the Iranian police, and then as the opposition to the Shah solidified, the tragic fire in the Rex Theater in Abadan in August. Hundreds died in that fire, allegedly set by Savak, either to capture or kill several key agents of the Khomeini revolution known to be inside. A man charged with some responsibility for those two episodes was Reza Razmi, said by the present Iranian embassy in Washington to be a Savak agent. He was police chief in Qom in January and in Abadan in August. Reza Razmi, do you know the name? Yes. Who? He used to be the police chief of the city of Qom. He committed great atrocities there, had people shot on the streets. And he was taken to Abadan and promoted to a general's rank because he had performed gallant duty. And uh, 
in Abadan during his tenure there as the police chief of the city uh, the Rex cinema fire a very controversial fire broke out in which about 600 people 500 people I don't exactly remember a huge number uh, died were incinerated incinerated policemen actually prevented the people from breaking a hole into the wall or somehow breaking the walls down or the doors down and getting the people out. Today, that former chief of police, Reza Razmi, lives under an alias in Fresno, California. We found him there and tried to talk to him, but he refused. We learned he had entered the United States in January of 79. The Iranians have protested to the State Department what they call Razmi's asylum here. They say they want him back in Tehran for trial. And the State Department acknowledges that an informal protest was lodged with Secretary Vance last October by Iran's then Foreign Minister Ibrahim Yazdi, and that Vance promised to look into the matter but said he would need evidence on which to proceed. Both sides agree the Iranians have yet to produce that evidence. The CIA refused us any comment whatsoever on Razmi, but the FBI told us they had learned the date of his entry into the Fort of New York, and after he settled in California, they said, Razmi called the CIA for protection. The FBI said the CIA had referred him to them, and the FBI office in San Francisco referred him to the local police. So the Razmi mystery remains, and he remains in Fresno. We should make it clear that no one we have spoken to, Iranian or American, has suggested there was any collusion between American authorities and the Shah's officials to arrange for Razmi's entry into the United States in January of 79. Joseph Sisko is today Chancellor of American University in Washington. But for 25 years, he was in the State Department. His last chore is undersecretary to Henry Kissinger. And though he acknowledges the excesses that took place in Iran, he says there is another side to the story, the accomplishments of the Shah, that too many people are right now unwilling to credit. What I'm trying to suggest to you is, in the present emotional environment, take in Iran, uh, do you think that they're either the commission or the people in Iran, uh, the leadership in Iran, uh, are able today to look at this in the context of 25 years of Iranian-American relationships? Uh, the very fact that the Iranian-U.S. Uh, relationship uh, provided a certain umbrella for Iran to permit uh, the country to develop uh, economically, uh, to permit uh, education to be broadened, to permit uh, land reform, to permit uh, a new industrial uh, class. In other words, for there to be 20 or 25 years of progress towards uh, bringing Iran to uh, a modern state. If that is true, I ask Sisko, why did the Iranians overthrow the Shah? Why do they apparently hate him so? number of reasons. Uh, one, no real opportunity for political expression. Uh, secondly, uh, a certain amount of repression. Third, there's no question, uh, Mike, uh, that uh, in and around the throne, uh, corruption uh, had developed. I don't say there weren't grievances. I think it's important, however, as we look at this, uh, to look at both the positive and the negative elements. Understood. And we share a measure of responsibility. I don't, I don't uh, either condone... How much of a measure of responsibility do you think that we bear? Very difficult, because what has developed is the myth of American control in relationship to um, Iran or, for that matter, to third world countries. Let me read to you from a Senate Foreign Relations Committee report with, with which I'm sure you're familiar. In the 1970s, three or four CIA officials met weekly with their Savak counterparts to discuss common interests. This was at a time when it was well known that Savak agents in the United States, according to this same once secret Senate report, said Significant police, security, and non-diplomatic political activity is carried out by Savak in the United States, including, quote, the planned assassination of a U.S. citizen by a man who told the CIA he had been tasked by Savak to kill a U.S. citizen. Just one example. Well, you can't possibly condone anything like that, and uh, I don't think, uh, I don't know of anyone who does. Just today, 
We're doing this interview on Monday, February 25th, right? Just today, Mr. Sisko, Iran's president, Bani Sadr, said that he's amazed at the naivete of the United States of U.S. officials and said that America still fails to understand the revolution that overthrew the Shah. To break Tehran's American hostage stalemate, says President Bani Sadr, the United States could clear the unfavorable climate in relations between the two nations by conceding to Iran three demands. This according to President Bani Sadr. They are admission of U.S. past wrongs, a pledge not to interfere in our internal affairs and future, and agreeing not to block our efforts to get back the Shah and the wealth of Iran he embezzled. Are those demands in your, I mean, you're a trained diplomat. Are those so unacceptable? Mike, in this situation, um, there can only be one negotiator, and that is the President of the United States. And he's vowed never to apologize. Who has all of the information at his uh, disposal. Grievances, yes, they can be aired and they can be discussed but not in circumstances why, while uh, 50 Americans are paying the price. They did not have the right to take the hostages because hostage taking in my book and in my value system is thoroughly condemned. The American people do not owe it to the Iranians, okay, to come out and confess guilt, as you say. They owe it to themselves. They owe it to their constitution. They owe it to the concept of America as a citadel of democracy and freedom. Do you think that we are wrong to bring out this material for the American public at this time? No, I don't think that uh, uh, you're wrong in bringing out this material at this time. Um, the reason why I was anxious to talk to you in response to your uh, query is that I felt that uh, this material is quite relevant but it's important that this material be evaluated by the American public, by the world, within the broad context of Iranian-American relationships without condoning it. I don't, I'm not condoning uh, these actions, as you well know, but within the broad context of Iranian-U.S. relations, as well as the positive benefits to the West and to the Iranian people over a period of a quarter of a century. Have like six presidents and six secretary of states just can't be totally wrong. Nevertheless, it was the decision of this president and this secretary of state, their decision to permit the Shah to enter the United States last October that triggered the capture of the embassy and the taking of the hostages, a decision about which they'll have some tough questions to answer once the hostages are free. For example, was the admission of the Shah to the United States an instant response to the plea of a desperately sick man? Not according to a State Department contingency document classified secret sensitive and entitled planning for the Shah to come to the United States. Written three months before the Shah's arrival, it says that once the Khomeini regime is firmly established, quote, it seems appropriate to admit the Shah to the United States. Three months later, he arrived presumably for emergency medical treatment. But Washington had been warned by the embassy in Tehran. A cable from the charge there said, I doubt that the Shah being ill would have much ameliorating effect on the degree of reaction here. About that reaction, the State Department reported spelled out the danger of hostages being taken and went on, when the decision is made to admit the Shah, we should quietly assign additional American security guards to the embassy to provide protection for key personnel until the danger period is considered over. According to Henry Precht, head of the Iranian desk in the State Department, those guards were never provided. And finally, on the issue of whether the Iranians had assured the Americans that they would protect the embassy if the Shah were to come to the United States. The Americans say the Iranians pledged they would. But yesterday, Iran's former foreign minister, Ibrahim Yazdi, told me that when informed officially just 24 hours before the arrival of the Shah in New York, Yazdi says he warned the State Department, you are playing with fire, there will be a very drastic reaction. And on that subject, when President Carter asked Secretary Vance if the embassy could be protected, the secretary told me Friday, we said we could, but we didn't.